Okay. Let's come here. We will now go back and readjust. And it's going to fit. Cool. All right. <coughs> so many of you probably know that Dr. Crandall and uh, Dr. Tabin and I, and uh, one of Dr. Crandall's old, um, well, he's not old, but he's one of Dr. Crandall's former uh, fellows, Roger Furlong, who's now in Montana, uh, all went to South Sudan at the invitation of uh, John Dow, who, is, who was the leader of the Lost Boys of Sudan, who um, is the subject of the movie God Grew Tired of Us. And uh, that was a movie at s that won uh, an award at Sundance about five years ago. Um, I'll tell a little bit more about him as we go. So if anybody saw the TV thing, um, the uh, bats will make sense. Um, we had bats in the OR. So just a little brief about South Sudan. Um, the uh, Carter Center did a study and found that 15% of the people in Ayod County, which was the county north of where we were, were affected by tra trachoma, and 3% of those were children, or 3% of children were affected by trachoma. Blindness estimates range from 2 to uh, almost 10%, depending on where you get your resources. Um, either way, 2% uh, is high and 10% and is, is ridiculous for uh, blindness in a population. Um, most of the blindness, like most places in the developing world, is easily treated or prevented. Uh, cataracts, of course, are one of the common causes. Uh, corneal blindness from trachoma and river blindness was common, um, and glaucoma was, was very common. Uh, the Republic of South Sudan is the newest country in the world. When we got our visas, uh, mine was visa number 672. So, you know, that's, that's pretty early in the process. Um, it, they've had a total of 15 years of peace since 1955. Um, and peace is a word that I think can be used loosely since they're, they're in a state of peace right now. Um, however, uh, roughly a thousand people have been killed in the Jiang Lai state in the last two months. Um, <coughs> about 90% of the population lives on less than a dollar a day. They have some of the worst maternal mortality. 2% uh, of childbirths result in death of the mother, and 13.5% of childbirths result in death of the child. Uh, there's only three surgeons in the whole country. There's only one ophthalmologist who's Ethiopian, and he spends a significant amount of his time outside of South Sudan in Ethiopia. Um, this is a view flying in uh, to Juba. I think that's the Nile in the background. Um, and then a view flying into the village of Duke Payuel which was John Dow's home village. And you can see the little huts here. This is the plane we flew in on. Um, and I actually had a, a really exciting experience on the flight out. Uh, I think it would have been exciting for Dr. Crandall too, had he known. But I was flying the plane um, over the Rift Valley of Kenya for about an hour. The pilot turned to me and said, hey, you ever flown a plane? No. You want to? Yeah. All right, here goes. <laughs> um, <laughs> it was exciting. This is uh, refueling the plane. The pilot dropped us off. Uh, he had about three minutes to turn around and get back in the air in order to make it back home um, before, before sundown. And uh, they originally brought him a can of automobile fuel. And he said, no, no, that's the wrong stuff, jet fuel. So they went and got a different one. Um, but I hate to think what would happen if you started putting the wrong stuff in the plane. And then the pilot took off. And then we were pretty much alone in this little village. Uh, this is the outhouse. Uh, not everybody's favorite place. This is where we stayed. Uh, we each shared a tent. Um, it was pretty interesting. Killed a scorpion right here one morning. So it was a, it was pretty out there. This is the village. 
This is the village at, at uh, sundown. Uh, and this is the hospital. This is the pet antelope that they had, which was kind of interesting being that close. You could feed it in the morning with a bottle. And these are the, the patients coming in. Uh, some of the patients walked as far as 80 to 100 miles to come to the clinic. One of the uh, South Sudanese named Auger had uh, had some training that uh, Dr. Tabin sent him to get. He had some training in Nepal. And so he went out into villages all around before we got there, did some assessments of, of blindness, identified blind patients, and then told them to come to clinic uh, when we arrived. So uh, this will just be some photos of uh, people being led in. This is sort of how you travel when you're blind in uh, South Sudan. You hold one end of the stick and then uh, people lead you along. There were so many sticks in the uh, preoperative area that I almost put my own eye out. Um, you just sticks everywhere, so. And Crocs. <laughs> Somebody brought a shipment of Crocs to South Sudan somewhere, so those were very common. So this was sponsored through the International Division of the Moran Eye Center. So when, when I first arrived, <coughs> we flew in in two groups because our, uh, our gear was too heavy, uh, not ourselves, but our gear was too heavy to fly it all in, all of us and all our gear at one time. So um, I, uh, Julie Crandall, Michael Yeh, and emergency uh, medicine, or two emergency medicine doctors who'd worked there before, and uh, his son and a friend of his son flew in first. And Dr. Crandall and Dr. Tabin uh, and Dr. Furlong stayed back in Nairobi to do some training there. So <coughs> setting up the, the clinic fell on me. And so the way we arranged it was this was the registration. A patient would come in here and either they had a chart already made by Auger, or if they didn't have a chart, then we made a new one on a card. Then we checked their vision on the side of the building, and then they moved into the building, which was a pretty packed every day. And then we would do eye exams, sort of just going around the, the, uh, the circle. Uh, Dave Reed helped. He's an emergency medicine doctor. He helped with the eye exams. Uh, Michael Ye is our international, uh, one of our international people here. And so he was uh, helping out. And uh, Julie Crandall also helped tremendously. Um, I can't give her enough credit for, for getting all the equipment together to bring and organizing things and uh, all the work that she did. Uh, I'm probably shouting right now, Lavinian, Lavinian, which means open your eyes. Uh, you can see the bell's reflex. I have never met people who can squeeze harder than these people. And you can hold their lid up and they can bells for five minutes straight. They never get tired. And the eye never comes down. Um, so exams were pretty difficult. Uh, thanks to Dr. Teske for loaning us his indirect. Um, that was very, very helpful. So all patients were initially screened by Julie, Michael, and, the and Dave Reed, the emergency medicine doctor. And then I saw every patient at the end after they'd been dilated to either confirm or change what their diagnosis was. So this is a quote that Dr. Tabin likes to say a lot, um, but it, it kind of sums up how a lot of people feel in the developing world about blindness, um, that a person who's blind is a mouth with no hands because uh, the blind person, when s studies have shown when a person becomes blind in the developing world, they take an average of two to two and a half people out of the workforce, the blind person and the people that care for them. And so blindness can plunge a family that was on the edge of destitution into absolute poverty. Um, often blind people are totally neglected 
and uh, the life expen expectancy of a blind person in the developing world is a half to a third that of an age match control. So you're not just giving people their sight back, but you're changing the economic status of their family, and in some way you're saving their life. So I have a couple quotes uh, from blind people in the developing world about how they feel about it. Um, this is a quote from an adult. He says, I'm nothing but a burden. I've lost many things over the years, but most of all, I've lost my dignity by being blind. Every morning I wake up feeling hopeless and worthless inside. Each morning I try to figure out how I can kill time for the whole day. And a child says, I'm blind and I don't deserve any friends. I'm not capable of doing anything but sitting in my home with my grandparents all the time. Nobody is willing to play with me. I can't see now, and I'm afraid I'll never see again. These are some of the patients. You can see those cataracts probably from the back row. Seems to be business. Cataracts. Maybe one of the residents can try to identify this difficult diagnosis. Uh, this is a picture I just pulled off the web because I didn't have a camera, but I can't tell you how many times I saw this. Um, even in children as young as 15, just completely cupped out nerves. Um, and trachoma uh, with severe entropion, trichiasis, and corneal blindness. Let's go to the close-up view of that. So this is the, as best as we know, this is the first eye surgery performed in Duke County of South Sudan. Um, when Jeff Tabin got off the airplane, the first thing he asked me is, have you done surgery yet? I said, yes, I have. He said, but don't feel bad. You'll have the second eye surgery in South Sudan. This is the Prabhu procedure, and I had discussed this with uh, Dr. Patel before, um, before I went to South Sudan. I was taught this in Zambia by a, a physician uh, when I was a medical student, but Dr. Patel said he, he really likes this procedure. Um, in the developing world, so it was the procedure I used. There are other um, procedures that can be used here. Uh, this is our, our encampment in the evening. And then after two days, uh, Dr. Tabin and Dr. Crandall arrived, and this was uh, part of the welcoming party. Just by reference, this guy is six foot seven, but that guy is just as tall. And this lady's pretty close, and this guy's about as tall, and that guy's probably 6'5". Like, is the first place I've ever been where I felt short all the time. And wait till Crandall and Taven got there, you know? <laughs> <laughs> this is uh, John Dow and our illustrious surgeon. Um, this is Mr. Marmot. He's a Marmot-sponsored athlete who uh, took a lot of our photos. This was the bowl that they gave us, and they also offered Dr. Tabin a plot of land. I was trying to convince him to uh, become a South Sudanese farmer, but uh, we just ate the bowl instead. This is the operating room. Uh, we had a small generator and then two operating microscopes. It was about 105 degrees, so uh, Alan still managed to wear scrubs, but uh, Jeff switched to shorts and a light shirt. And we had a South Sudanese person and Julie Crandall uh, did most of the, uh, the OR checking. And that was our generator. <coughs> this is what our charts look like after a day. Um, the other thing I want you to notice is how dusty and dirty it is. So we as part of the operating room procedure, uh, all patients had a face washing with soap uh, prior to their retrobulbar block. Cataract surgery, IOL, and the uh, cataract. This is 
Did you add your furlong green twiggy? Alan using the spirit lamp. Um, he said he hadn't used one of these since the 60s. So uh, they're pretty cool. They run on uh, ethanol and you have a little brass ball that heats up in a point and it's a, it's a pretty neat way of doing pottery. This is Francis Gao. He was a South Sudanese who'd been trained to do a bilamellar lid rotation. So he came and helped us with trachiasis surgery and did 18 of them bilaterally. So that was very helpful. <coughs> this is what happens when the sun goes down. You can see that other than this small globe of light, the rest of the room is completely black. It's still 105 degrees and I'm pretty much dripping sweat. but. Uh, when we had a couple suture packs that had sort of a bluish suture, and you couldn't even see the suture against their dark skin in that amount of light. So you have to sort of feel for it. Um, so I made sure after dark I used only the white sutures. This is the last patient um, waiting for her cataract surgery on our last day. And now the fun stuff, post-op. Um, post-op clinic was a zoo for the most part, but uh, between Dr. Tabin, his entourage of photographers and excited patients and family members, um, it, it was pretty wonderful to, to see that moment where you take the patch off and the patient, there's this lag time where they, they open their eye and they're, they're not really even sure what's happening for a few minutes and then, and then they start to realize that they can see. Uh, it's pretty wonderful. Yeah, it's a zoo. <laughs> and then we eventually moved the uh, post ops outside because there were so many. So we would do it here. This is one, one of the ladies from the original uh, pictures where you saw her cataract and Roger Furlong and Michael Yeo. Julie helping out with the post-op. Even though it was a lovely patch and stuff, you know, it's 100 degrees and people were wearing ski caps and big fuzzy hats and North Face jackets when it got down to 80. Um, This was one of the other patients that was in those pre-op pictures. This is John Dow. Um, a little bit about John Dow. John Dow started the clinic where we were. And uh, John Dow was the subject of the movie God Grew Tired of Us, which I think I said. But when John Dow was 13 years old, he was still about six foot nine. And he led 27,000 boys between the ages of 3 and 13 out of South Sudan on a 1,000 mile walk to Ethiopia while they were being bombed by the North Sudanese government, attacked by wild animals and starving. And then after spending a year in a refugee camp in Ethiopia, uh, they were driven out of there and walked another 1,000 miles to Kenya. And he led these boys on this whole, this whole route they started with 27,000 and about 11,000 of them died along the way. Um, and he was essentially, they, they elected him their leader, so to speak, because he was the tallest. Um, but then he was brought to the United States uh, through a refugee program and, and lived in Syracuse, New York, where he worked three jobs to send money home. Um, and eventually, uh, he got on his feet enough that he decided that he wanted to go back to South Sudan and make a difference there. Um, so he built a clinic in what had been his home village, which had been burned to the ground during the Second Sudanese War. And um, now this clinic is the only thing that provides health care for this whole county. Uh, he's also involved on a relatively higher up political level in working for peace in South Sudan. Um, really an amazing guy and, and a tremendous asset to everything we did there. Um, 
she's waiting for surgery on the second eye. Uh, this lady walked 80 miles to see us um, to have cataract surgery and had a great result. Um, just celebrating all the way home. Well, I didn't follow her all the way home. I don't know if I can walk 80 miles. Very tough people. That shows you how tall John is. The photographers couldn't take pictures of John and Alan in the same picture without standing on a chair. Otherwise, John's head was behind the sky, and then he's so dark that you either had the sky bright white and only a dark face, or a bright face and everything else washed out. So, this is our team again. And this is the, the uh, woman who helped us in the OR. And she did a really tremendous job as well. Uh, these were our guards. We had guards armed like this, sort of around the periphery of the, um, of the, the hospital. You didn't see them a whole lot, but they'd wander in for dinner with their guns and wander back out. Um, one morning, they, they told us, don't worry unless you hear, if you hear a shot, it's not a big deal. Don't worry unless you hear shots that answer the first shot. And he's laying in bed one morning and pop, pop, pop. It's like, oh, it's too late. I'm going to have to run out into the bush in my underwear and hide under a tree or something, and then uh, then we found out that they were they were just um, one of them had died from a, a sickness overnight, and they were giving him a three gun salute in the morning. These things suck. I hate them. They're huge. They hurt like the dickens when they bite you. It bleeds. Um, they're tsetse flies, and uh, while you're doing surgery, you'd be doing something delicate, and it. So it, it was miserable. I'm glad we don't have these in the operating room. These were nice in the operating room because they eat the flies. There were about 2,000 bats that lived in the hospital. So once the sun got down, the operating room was really kind of exciting to have four or five bats sort of swirling around the room, cleaning up the insects while you worked. Um, fortunately, they are pretty good at not running into you. So just a little bit of data from our trip. We saw a total of 284 patients, most of which we saw in the first two days. They ranged from age three to 89, um, and about two-thirds were female and one-third male. Of that, 20% had seen an eye doctor in some other area, like Kenya or in the capital city. And most of them came from Duke County, but some of them came from as far away as Boar South or Eurora County, which is uh, about 100 miles away. Um, of the patients we saw, 133 or 53% had no eye better than count fingers, and 35% had no eye better than hand motion. So um, a lot of people had severe bilateral blindness. These are our top diagnoses. These are now per eye. So out of 568 eyes, and some eyes have multiple diagnoses, so that's why this number is more than, than 568, there were 295 cataracts out of 284 patients that were visually significant. Um, trichiasis was very common, 113 eyes with trichiasis uh, from trachoma. 80 patients had corneal blindness in at least one eye. 63 uh, eyes had end-stage glaucoma. And we actually even saw nyctalopia from uh, vitamin A deficiency. Uh, Dr. Crandall, Dr. Tabin, and Dr. Furlong together did 181 cataract surgeries. And uh, Dr. Gao, Dr. Tabin, and I together did 120 eyelids uh, for trichiasis. And on post-op day two, um, we had 67% of patients with 2200 or better. 
uh, I suspect that the final numbers, um, once corneal edema um, and everything is cleared up, that there would still be roughly 10% or so of these patients who did not get uh, good visual results because they either had glaucoma that, um, that we couldn't diagnose prior to taking out the cataract and then you take out the cataract and you look back at the nerve and it's completely cupped. Or uh, there are a couple of patients who had a retinal detachment that was hiding behind the cataract that we didn't know about. Um, this is the softer side of Alan Crandall. This little baby just walked up to him and grabbed his hand um, in one of the villages. So that's it. But I do want to thank Dr. Crandall and Dr. Tabin for taking me uh, to South Sudan. It was a great experience, and I really appreciate getting work to work with those two guys. They're, they're really amazing people. Any questions?